All right. A full house. Wonderful. Um, uh, for those of you who don't have a, a seat, there is seating in our conference room, room 308 on the third floor. If you take the elevator on the opposite side of the building to the third floor, follow the signs for 308. You can sit up there and watch the program as well. So we invite you to do, take advantage of that if you don't have a place to sit. So on behalf of the First Fridays Committee and the Archives and Special Collections Department, welcome to First Fridays. It's October and our new season is starting. My name is Linnea Anderson and I am a member of the First Fridays Committee and the Archivist of the Social Welfare History Archives. Welcome back to our re regular guests and a special welcome to any of you who are with us for the first time. And could we get a show of hands? Is this the first time you have ever been here? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> lots. The answer is lots. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so first Fridays is a monthly series of presentations. Whoops. You don't have strings left. A monthly series of presentations made possible by a generous gift from Governor Elmer L. Anderson and Mrs. Eleanor Anderson in honor of former library director Dr. Edward B. Stanford. The presentations are based on materials in the university libraries, archives, and special collections. This year's theme, for any of you who may have missed the wonderful lion sign on your way into the room, is Roaring Good Tales, Animals in the Archives. We worked very hard on that theme. Um, a reminder that we are streaming and video will be available later on on the University of Minnesota Library's YouTube channel. So there will be tours after the program with Tim Johnson. Tim? Uh, and we also have an opportunity to meet and greet special canine guests from the University Pet Away Worry and Stress Pause Program afterwards. So please keep that in mind. Don't rush away. Uh, before we move on to the rest of the program, we have um, some announcements, starting with Kirsten Clark, related to Friends of the Libraries. Thanks, Kirsten. Hi, everybody. My name is Kirsten Clark, and I work in the libraries, but I also serve on the Friends of the Library board. Um, it's really great seeing everybody here in, in the start of this new session. I just want to give you a little bit of information about the Friends of the Libraries. And so many of the collections that are a part of this series have their own Friends group, including the one today. Um, we have the Curling Collection, but we also have Friends groups associated with the uh, James Ford Bell Library, the Treader Collection, there's the Friends of the Anderson Horticultural Library, and the Friends of the Sherlock Holmes Collections, as well as our larger Friends of the Libraries group. And so I just wanted to let you all know that there's other ways besides coming to these amazing <laughs> sessions that you can uh, use to support the libraries and support some of these collections that you're going to be seeing. There's information at the table in the back of the room. I also have a flyer just of uh, upcoming events as well from our larger Friends of the Library group. So thank you. All right, I'm going to give a quick introduction to our speaker and then she also has a couple of announcements for us. So the presentation today is from um, uh, What Dogs Have Taught Me. Right, by Lisa Von Dresik, curator of the Children's Literature Research Collection. Canine characters take center stage as we examine the works of significant children books, children's book artists and writers. I'm looking forward to it. Lisa, come on up. Everybody's taller than me. Um, so my announcements include, oh, here we go. Um, Save the date, not this Saturday, but the one after is the Twin Cities Book Festival. And if you know any young people, I will be the master of ceremonies for the morning from 10 to 12, where we will be discussing, talking, and reading aloud with children's book authors and illustrators. So I urge you to go to the Twin Cities Book Festival, save that date. Where is it, Paul? It's at the fairgrounds at the... the the Progress Center at the, the Minnesota State Fairgrounds, and it's free. And it also, if you go online, you can get passes for the light rail and for buses and things like that for free also, because they want people to use public transportation to get there. And the festival is free itself. Thank you. Okay, that was Mr. Paul Von Dresik. He's from Mankato, Minnesota. 
And that explains how I got here. Um, the other thing is, do you know about University of Minnesota libraries publishing? You all know the University of Minnesota Press, but the University of Minnesota Libraries actually publishes books and they are free downloads, open access. So if you want to see the history of the curling collection, that's the ABC of it, Why Children's Book Matter, you can buy copies, but you can also get a free download. And our latest publication is Writing Boxes. If you're looking for things to do with young people, I've given many suggestions in this book, Writing Boxes. So that's our commercial. Oh, and because Mr. Von Dresik is here and he noted to me that I stole the title of my talk from Meryl Marco, she wrote a book called What the Dogs Have Taught Me, so, which was a very good book too. But you cannot copyright titles. <laughs> Just remember that. <laughs> this is Mr. Beefy. Mr. Beefy is an oil painting from a book called Once I Ate a Pie. <laughs> the title of the poem, the first poem of the book is Once I Ate a Pie. I am not thin, but I am beautiful. I steal tubs of butter off the table and take them to the basement to eat in private. <laughs> Once, I ate a pie. <laughs> it is impossible to select one, two, three, four, a dozen children's books that feature dogs. Over 60 million households in the United States contain at least one dog. When we think of dogs, I was actually going to title this talk, No More Dead Dogs. <laughs> because people of a certain generation know that the dog always dies. You know, I love that dog like a rabbit loves to run. Yeah, old dog. That tells you right away what's going to happen. <laughs> a dog like Jack was a contender on the short list of the Irma Black Awards, which means I had to read it out loud to 16 classes. And right in the middle is, Mom says Jack is dead. <laughs> I know. I could do this all day. And when we think about dogs in children's books, we think about the world of dogs in children's books. This is a Japanese talk, dog, and you know, uh, the dog did not survive the trip. So um, Lynn Reiser, a great uh, professor of early childhood education and psychology at Yale University, um, sent this to us for the archives and collections, just as a precursor for future donations. What would the world be like without music or rivers or the green and tender grass the poet Mary Oliver asks in her book, Dog Songs, what would this world be like without dogs? <laughs> Little Dog's Rhapsody in the Night. He puts his cheek against mine and makes small expressive sounds, and when I'm awake, or awake enough, he turns upside down his four paws in the air and his eyes dark and fervent. Tell me you love me, he says. Tell me again. <laughs> Could there be a sweeter arrangement? Over and over, he gets to ask. I get to tell. So when we're looking for books, 
children's books, juvenile books in WorldCat, and we do a little survey. About 1,500 children's books a year feature dogs. This is over the last five years, about 1,500. And we got a lot of them. This is Maurice Sendak and his dog Herman. I hate people, he said at one point, extolling the superior company of dogs, like his sweet-tempered German shepherd, Herman, after Melville. In the same interview, he said, um, don't tell Herman I'm Jewish. <laughs> I could spend an hour talking about Maurice Sendak and dogs because there is a dog in almost every one. I haven't found a book. There isn't a dog hidden away somewhere in there. This is a hole is to dig. We hold the art to that book. And there you see dogs as dogs. So there's a dog in the Mary Oliver pose. <laughs> and we remember Max who gets sent to his room because he's terrorizing the dog. Now, Maurice Sendak had a Sealingham Terrier named Jenny, and Higgledy Piggledy Pop, there must be more to life, is the perfect example of what we call people in animal suits. So when we're thinking about children's literature, we're thinking about picture books and chapter books, um, the dog is a substitute for the reader. And there's Jenny. Jenny, the sealing ham terrier, has everything she, she could ever want. She had her own comb, brush, two different bottles of pills, eye drops, ear drops, a thermometer, and for cold weather, a wool sweater. There were two windows for her to look out of and two bowls to eat from. She even had a master who loved her, yet Jenny was discontented and doesn't care about all that, saying she wants something I do not have. There must be more to life than having everything. <laughs> you have everything, says the potted plant on the windowsill. Jenny responds by chewing off the plant. First one leaf, then a few more, then all of the plant until it cannot speak anymore to Jenny about how foolish she is to leave her happy home. So she packs up all of her belongings and leaves home for good. And we hear echoes of many children's books in this, like The Runaway Bunny. It reflects the life of the child and it also, it's doggish because it's Maurice Sendak. And Jenny enjoys her trip away from home and never returns. She's very happy out in the world. Read the book. <laughs> but there's also books about real things. Now, when we think about graphic format and people talking about how new that is, One Swell Pup from the 1970s. This is his experience with the monks of New Skeet, and he's discussing, are you ready for a dog? And to this day, it is the most practical guide that if you have someone in your life who wants a puppy, Somebody wants a puppy, hand them this book, and they can go through it and see if they're ready to have a dog. One, some swell pup, and that's by Maurice Sendak. Sendak said, humans always present their real selves to their dogs. They can't wear a mask, they can't fool a dog, and that by digging deeper into that dog-man relationship, we are able to look at our own problems weaknesses and fears. So I've talked about dogs as dogs, information books, um, fiction, uh, reflecting children's lives, dogs as people. And so if we're gonna look, look historically, and just today, where is Gretchen Ronka? She brought me some donations. This book is a pre-1900s. It's not the strong suit of our collection, but this entire alphabet book is all about children and their pets, and most of them are dogs. They're so, all big dogs. All big dogs. No little teeny mother goose dogs. 
So as we look historically, dogs have been part of the lives of children's literature from Mother Goose on. But also Arthur Rackham featured them in many of his illustrations, and this is Cinderella, and this is Cinderella dancing with the dogs. The first American wordless book was a dog book. This is Macmillan in 1932, published by Louise Seaman Bechtel. And the dog starts out, it's a dog, it's a dog, and it sniffs something, and oh, there's a wolf. And we, we go through, and it's protecting the rabbit from the wolf. But then it runs down into the burrow where the rabbits are, still very doggish, canine-like. And then it becomes a fantasy into the lives of the rabbits. So we have both that, the real and the unreal together in the first wordless picture book published in the United States. So if you know Martha, Martha eats a bowl of uh, alphabet soup and then has no control over her mouth. <laughs> And this is a great picture book if you're ever discussing with a child, there's a right time and a place. <laughs> and everything you think of does not have to come out of your mouth as it does with Martha. Bad dog, Bob. And so there are the classics, Angus and the Ducks. And I could not speak without talking about Pokey Little Puppy, our very own Pokey Little Puppy. And, um, we have very doggish behavior, but we also have people in animal suits. And my husband would say, I'm the pokey little puppy. Come on, pokey. What did you see, a butterfly? Come, come, come. Walk, walk, walk. Stay with the group. And when we think of Ezra Jack Keats, and we think of a snowy day, and we also think of Whistle for Willie, but you know, before he did those, he did a book called My Dog is Lost, featuring a child from Puerto Rico. And when we're thinking about that we need diverse books and we need to show all kinds of people in books, that Ezra Jack Keats was there in 1960, producing books that reflect the lives of children and give other children a window into it. And that was Rudin Sims Bishop, uh, Windows and Mirrors. Um, this is me and Rocket. And you say, who is Rocket? Well, you know, if I had to pick my top 10 dog books, Rocket Learns to Read is it. On the, what makes a great picture book, whether it's got dogs or not, is one you can read again and again. And Rocket is one that is, there's Rocket minding his own business. This little bird comes down and says, oh, good, you're my student. And Rocket says, I, I'm not a student. She says, oh, yes, I'm going to teach you to read. And through 32 pages, we slowly learn about the alphabet, how to sound out words, and how to read short words. And when I read this aloud to second graders, to third graders, fourth graders are the ones that are very serious about the discussion because they will tell you that yes, it takes Rocket, that whole book, to learn to read. And reading is hard and it takes time and you have to have a good teacher. And when I started exploring the archives, I was shocked and surprised and amazed and fabulous. We own the original art for Five Dog Night. Now this is not really a book about dogs, it's a book about cold. And you may have heard, winter is coming. And it's about the seasons changing, perfect topic for kids. It's about neighbors helping neighbors, but it's also about how important it is to be warm in the winter, to be prepared, and it's gonna get that cold. <laughs> so when it is 17 below zero, you can turn to your loved ones and say, it's a five dog night. <laughs> and we talk about serious topics. Picture books give us that opportunity to share, to learn, 
to enter the social emotional world of all kinds of people. This is Jessica. Jessica lost both her legs in the Boston Marathon bombing. And she struggled and she was depressed and she was anxious. And Rescue is the dog. He was named that before he showed up in her life. Rescue was raised in a prison. And this is a picture book, Big Ideas, Big Subject, Big Feelings. I actually don't believe there's such a thing as this would not be appropriate for kids of all ages to share and talk about the resilience of Jessica and the helpingness of rescue. Oh, in case you're wondering, because I know you're thinking this right about now, oh, she just loves dog books. She's like, like, if she could read aloud all year, that's all she would do is dog books. This is the worst book ever published. <laughs> and we own it here at the Archives and Special Collections because we love Arnold Adolf. So we have pretty much have a complete everything you want. We've got Daring Dog and Captain Cat. He has a lot of dog books. The Return of Rex and Ethel, in case you're wondering, it's out of print, so if you're gonna read it, you have to read it here. The Return of Rex and Ethel. Rex and Ethel die the same day. <laughs> they live next door to each other. They spend the entire book haunting the little girls who live <laughs> next door to each other. It is a misery. And just as bad books do, they don't stay in print and they go away. So I, I believe in the marketplace. I don't need to pull this off the shelf because it will scar someone for life. It's not on the shelf. Oh, it's so horrible. But when we think back, the first thing when I thought of dogs and children's books, I thought of Ribsy. I thought of Beverly Cleary, the kids on Click, to click a cut street, and wherever Henry is, there's Ribsy. Beverly Cleary was a children's librarian, and the children in her library said to her, could you give me a book about kids like me, boys like me? And that's how she started her career with Henry Huggins. And the most famous is not Ribsy, the most famous is Ramona. But Ribsy reminds us that most in children's books, the dogs are not the most attractive beings. <laughs> Ribsy needs a bath almost every book and has fleas. But we love Ribsy. And Ramona loves Ribsy. And Henry loves Ribsy. But when I thought of that, I realized there was a direct link to Because of Winn-Dixie. I'm going to read the first page of Because of Winn-Dixie, chapter one, Because of Winn-Dixie by Kate DiCamillo. My name is India Opal Baloney, and last summer my daddy, the preacher, sent me to the store for a box of macaroni and cheese, some white rice, and two tomatoes. And I came back with a dog. <laughs> it just sings. When Dixie, a dog who, quote, looked like a big piece of old brown carpet that had been left out in the rain. Yeah, so you can see that. We talk about learning to read and literacy and the kid who's struggling in third grade and it's not happening and not happening. And we always say, don't worry. One day you'll see the movie in your head. But this dog had a grin so big it made him sneeze. And as Opal says, it's hard not to immediately fall in love with a dog who has a good sense of humor. So in picture books, we want art and language and page turns and drama. And in chapter books, we want to see the movie in our head. It was published 20 years after Henry Huggins. It's a great story about forgiveness and hope, the combination of sweetness and sorrow that we have in life. Dee Camillo said she wrote the book during the worst winter on record here in Minnesota. I think we beat that, yeah. I moved here. 
It was the worst winter in 33 years, according to the weatherman who spends 20, day, 20 minutes at a time talking about 1942. I had no money to go back home. She lived in Florida, she was from Florida. And it was the first time I'd been without a dog for an extended period of time. So I made the dog up, the best kind of dog I could imagine, a big stinky mutt. Dogs have a way of getting into people's hearts. They can open doors humans can't enter. That's Kate. I'm gonna finish with this book. Let's get a pup, said Kate. And so think about all the things I've been speaking about. Community, family, language, literacy. This book has it all. By Bob Graham. The end of Kate's bed was a lonely place. Tiger the cat no longer slept there. Tiger died last winter. So there were only Kate's two feet to keep each other company. Now Kate woke to full summer with the sun pouring over the back fence. Let's get a pup, said Kate. What a brand new one, said now wide awake mom. With the wrapping still on, added her breathless, breathless dad. Pups don't come wrapped, replied Kate. I know they don't, said dad. It was just a joke. Mom looked in the paper. It must be small, said Kate. And cute, said dad. And get all excited, said Kate. And run around in circles, said dad. And hmm, said mom, look. The Rescue Center, the Center for Dogs Without a Home, the Center for Dogs All Alone. With their breakfast uneaten, they dressed and left immediately. At the Rescue Center, they found plenty of dogs without a home and lots of dogs all alone. They found big dogs, small dogs, sniffers and sleepers, wired-haired, short-haired, scratchers and leapers. They found fighters and biters and growlers and snarlers, short dogs, dogs long and thin, and dogs with their cheeks sucked in. They also found happy dogs, sad dogs, take me dogs, and dogs who couldn't care less. They saw smelly dogs, fat dogs, lean and mean dogs, chew it up and spit it out at you dogs, and dogs like walking nightmares. Then they saw Dave. Dave was so excited he came out sideways. He barked twice, water flew off his tongue, and he turned a complete circle in the air. He was small, he was cute, and he was brand new. Dave climbed right over the top of Kate, who briefly wore him like a hat. <laughs> He's all we want, said Kate. All that we came for, said Mom. We'll take him, said Dad, and then they saw Rosie. And she saw them. She was old and gray and broad as a table. It was difficult for her to get to her feet, but she stood, it seemed, almost politely. Her eyes watered, her ears went back, and she radiated good intention. My wish for you, said Dad, is that you could lie on someone's living room floor or on their couch, said Mom. Or in someone's bed, said Kate. Mom's voice shook. We would take all of them if we could, but what can we do? And with many a backward glance, they slowly walked away. At home, Dave was everything a pup could be, and more. On his first night, he cried in his box. Next morning, Kate's mom and dad received a good licking. Dave was crying last night, so he slept with me, said Kate, but I didn't sleep. Neither did I, said dad. I was wishing. Neither did I, said mom. I was wishing. With breakfast once again uneaten, they dressed and left immediately. At the rescue center, Rosie was waiting for him. Let's get you home, said dad. Rosie was instantly at home. Her broad, heavy tail swept away everything on the low table. 
I've seen a dog smelling a man, but never a man smelling a dog, said Kate's mom. She needs a bath, said Dad. Now Dad's wish has come true. Rosie is asleep on the living room floor with Dave to keep her company. Mom's wish has also come true. Now Rosie and Dave are asleep on the couch. And what about Kate's wish? Will that come true as well? Yes, Dave and Rosie will get to sleep on someone's bed. Kate puts her head on Rosie's stomach. She hears angry gurgles, squeaks, and plops, and lonely corkscrew sounds, and then pump, pump, pump of Rosie's heart like a big hollow engine room. Kate's feet are no longer lonely under the blankets. It seems like Dave and Rosie have always been there. Their weight is comfortable and reliable and will stop Kate's bed from floating away into the night. The end. We have a